Okay, so our topic for class this evening, which you signed up for, is how to teach yourself or somebody else how to ride a bike. Now, normally, we are offering probably a dozen classes per week um, where we uh, provide bikes and helmets and people get to practice using the bikes that we own in over a dozen locations around New York City. But of course, uh, and I use this word normally a lot, uh, the coronavirus pandemic has really shut down all of our, you know, physical space, person to person, group classes. And uh, so we're, we're trying to fill the gap a little bit by offering this tutorial on the method that we use, how we teach people, our talking points, our teaching methods, how to prep the bike, all the stuff that we do to teach people, first timers, whether they're kids or adults, how to ride a bike. And so that's what we're going to do this evening. So uh, my name is Rich Conroy. I'm the education director at Bike New York. I've been at Bike New York uh, for uh, just over 15 years. I'm our longest serving staff member. And uh, I started our bike education program. And Learn to Ride is one of our oldest programs. And it's really become the program we've become known for. I'll say a little bit more about that. But uh, we, before we started our Bike Ed program, Bike New York was known and still is well known for the Five Borough Bike Tour. So our mission is to promote cycling in New York City uh, to get more people on more bikes more of the time and to encourage cycling as a fun, healthy, affordable, safe, way to get around New York City. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization. Um, and the Five Borough Bike Tour for the past, uh, well, since I started and before that, has funded everything we do. And of course, that tour got canceled this year, uh, along with all of our other events that bring in income. So if you, uh, get something out of this class, please do become a member. There is a membership tab on our webpage, bike.nyc, or you can make a donation. Um, I'm going to say that my program has really thrived. We've reached over 300,000 people in uh, the time that I started. And that, that 300,000 people is uh, with classes, and programming, not just like handing out a safety info card. In the past three years, we've reached uh, between 24,000 and 29,000, almost 30,000 people each year with classes and programming. And that represents at least an hour of contact with our bike ed program per person, not just handing them a safety card which we hope they read. Um, so uh, please do donate and uh, thank you for joining us. So what is Learn to Run? So I'm gonna tell you a little story. Uh, when I was about seven years old, uh, I wanted to learn, I was ready to learn how to ride a bike. And my older sister uh, helped me learn. And the way she did that, was, uh, you know, I had a hand-me-down bike, it probably had 24-inch wheels. She kind of held on to the handlebar, held on to me, or held on to the seat, and kind of pushed me along. And then she would let go, and, and maybe give me and or the bike a shove. And that's kind of how I learned how to ride a bike. And that's how a lot of people learn how to ride a bike. Now, if you're a parent, uh, that's just fun if you want to use that method. That's how most people learn. Um, 
but I'm going to say there are some issues with with that method. One is if you're teaching a little kid and you're a big tall person, crouching down that low while running along and walking alongside them is very hard work. And for the kid, the person who's learning, uh, they're always afraid of when when are you going to let go? And that's kind of a moment of terror for them. So uh, we've devised a different method and we didn't invent this method. It's just kind of out there. We were one of the first New York, one of the first bike organizations to turn this method into a large scale program. And the method is really is, you know, the person who wants to learn is teaching themselves how to ride a bike. We provide some tips and pointers and setup and things like that. But really, anything you do in life that involves balancing, the person learning really has to figure it out themselves. That's the way it is. When you are an infant, rolling over, sitting up, crawling, standing, walking, as much as our parents help and encourage us and hold our hands, really it's our, our brains and our balance that have to figure it figure it out on our own. So uh, we offer Learn to Ride classes as a standalone class, but we also incorporate it into all of our other programs, especially our youth programs. When we have a group of youth coming to us, there's always several kids who don't know how to ride a bike, and we don't exclude them. We make sure that while the other kids are practicing some other skills and going on rides, that the first timers have a chance to learn. We put it into New York City Department of Education programs uh, that we, we've helped develop. We do it in our own after school and summer programs. Um, so it's really become a big deal for us. Uh, you may have heard the rumors out that what we do is we take the pedals off when somebody is trying to learn how to ride a bike for the first time. Um, really, the, our method is that we teach balancing first. You have to balance and control the bike and be able to roll it along and then figure out the pedal. And we'll get into that. Now, in this picture, this gal is probably looks like she's pedaling the bike. But um, really, before we put the pedals back on her bike, we had her practicing how to balance and control it. And we're going to walk you through how to teach that. So our goals tonight, what we're going to cover is what you need to learn how to ride a bike or teach somebody else. We'll talk about how to set up the bike. We'll spend a brief moment about wearing a bike helmet and how to set it, you know, adjust and wear the bike. But the bulk of the presentation is going to be the methodology that we use for teaching and learning how to ride a bike. It does not involve the method that my sister used and that a lot of people use. We don't touch our students except to give them a high five. We don't hold them up. We don't generally hold the bike up for them. There will be an exception to that in a slide later on. Uh, we have some movies tonight, but my the person who assists me is not with us. She usually runs the movies, just trying to play them through Zoom. Doesn't work very well. Um, but believe it or not, I blew my 15 minutes of fame teaching Oh gosh, what was this Muppet's name from Sesame Street? Murray the Monster, teaching Murray the Monster and his sidekick, Ogihito, how to ride a bike. And it's a fun little video. You'll get that video tomorrow in the email. Okay, so obviously you're going to need a bike if you are doing this yourself. We would strongly recommend to keep that bike very simple and very basic. It's fine if it has a gear system, especially if it's an adult bike. 
but we would discourage road racing or road bikes that have a dropped curved handlebar. You want to keep the handlebar kind of like straight and flat. It's fine if you have a, a cruiser bike, like a beach cruiser, or a hybrid or a mountain bike that has a little bit of a riser or a flat handlebar. Um, we would also discourage fancy stuff like, you know, dual suspension frames for off-road mountain bikes, which we see in some kids' bikes. There's no reason why a kid living in an urban environment needs a dual suspension kid's mountain bike. Um, these frames are rigid, there's no suspension, and that's the best type of bike to really learn on. Um, it's fine if it has hand brakes, but you know, for kid bikes, we would discourage a lot of bells and whistles and features. Keep it simple. For adult bikes, again, I said, um, you know, it's fine if, if it has a gear system. Most adult bikes are going to have hand brakes, but really keep it simple. Uh, we would suggest 26 inch wheels for adults. Uh, the other size is 700C, uh, which you'll find a lot of hybrids. And this is kind of like a hybrid type bike uh, for first timers learning. Now, an important thing you need to know is the size and the fit of the bike. When the seat is all the way down, the new cyclist, the student, should be able to rest their feet flat on the ground. If you put the seat all the way down and they are tiptoe, the method that we are going to show you tonight is not going to work very well. So you look at this, uh, this, this student here, and he has a very nice BMX bike. Kids bike, very simple, has one hand brake, probably a coaster brake. And you can see he's sitting on the seat and his feet are resting flat on the ground. Feet not flat on the ground, this does not work. You're going to need a bike helmet. And we'll talk a little bit about how to fit and wear it, but please know hockey, construction, uh, baseball, horseback riding, lacrosse, or football helmet. It really needs to be a bike helmet. They're light and ventilated and they're manufactured and designed for riding a bike. Now you might need some tools. You're probably gonna need some tools. If you don't have tools and don't want to get them, and we're gonna walk you through how to use the tools to set up the bike, you can always ask a bike shop to do the tasks that we're gonna show you. So you're gonna probably need a floor pump to keep the tires inflated. You are definitely going to need either a mechanics wrench set that is metric, not English. So it has to be whole numbers, 14 millimeter, 15 millimeter, 13 millimeter, 17 millimeter. The most commonly used size will be 15 millimeter. Uh, you can get these at Harbor Freight, there's one in Brooklyn, there's one in Queens. Uh, you can buy them as a set, they're not that expensive and they're pretty good quality. Uh, you can order them online from big box retailers like Walmart, Sears. Um, those are the ones that come to mind. Or you can get uh, a basic adjustable mechanics wrench and I would not get anything longer than an eight inch handle which is about, the whole thing's about 11 inches long. If you get one with a longer handle, the wrench is gonna to be too thick to do some important things. Depending on your bike, you might need a metric hex key or what is also called an Allen wrench set. And I like the ones that come, you know, with a folding package like this, so you have most of the sizes you need to work on a bike. Keep in mind all the parts on a bike are metric. So you, you have to buy metric equipment. You might need a screwdriver probably in a Phillips size. This one shows a flat screwdriver. And you might need a pedal wrench. 
in case the spindle of the pedal is too skinny, too narrow to fit a regular mechanics wrench in there. And it has, pedal wrenches have two sides generally, a 15 millimeter and what's called a 916, it's the only like non-metric size you're gonna see. And you're gonna need some space. And that can be a little challenging in New York City because there's a lot going on and our spaces are very crowded. Uh, we use parks department, uh, multi-purpose play areas, which are large, mostly flat slabs of asphalt that are often, a, you know, kind of like a baseball field, really. And uh, early in the morning, those spaces were not really heavily used. If you try to go use them on a Saturday afternoon, it's going to be very busy. Uh, we also use parks department paths, especially ones that are kind of straight. Um, you can look at school play yards, especially if it doesn't have a lot of playground equipment. And those places are pretty empty on weekends. If you are joining us from not New York City, it's elsewhere, uh, I would look at parking lots that are maybe not used in the morning or on weekends or even a section of a parking lot that's quiet in kind of like not busy times. Trying to do this in a parking lot the day after Thanksgiving is probably not a good idea. So let's talk about what you have to do to set up the bike. And most of this is pretty easy. So first, pump up the tires using your pump. It's a good idea to have a pump with a gauge and you can find the rated pressure inflation of the tire. Um, on the side of the tire, it's stamped or printed. It can sometimes be hard to read, but it will say PSI or inflate to or maximum pressure. And you want to get it kind of close to that. Really, uh, tires deflate naturally on their own if they're left sitting around. And if you squeeze the tire and it's spongy and soft, it's going to be really hard work to learn how to ride a bike that way. So pump up the tires. Now, if you don't have a pump, and you can get pumps at bike shops, Amazon, online retailers like REI, uh, Harbor Freight, I think, carries pumps. If you don't have one, you can use a gas station air hose if you're careful. You have to inflate that slowly a little at a time because there's a lot of air coming out of those air compressors. And oftentimes bike shops leave either an air hose or a pump sitting outside during their business hours. So the customers can just do that basic pumping job rather than bringing it into a very busy step. You will likely need to put the seat down uh, some or all the way. And the way you do that is uh, there's going to be a collar at the top of the frame right here where the seat post, which is this part here that goes into the frame. And there's going to be usually a bolt of some sort that you have to loosen. Now, when you loosen something, almost everything on a bike, and there will be one important exception, to loosen it, you go counterclockwise. Okay. Um, on less expensive bikes and a lot of kids' bikes, you'll be able to use an adjustable wrench like this, or I think it's a 13 millimeter mechanics wrench. And you just loosen it. You don't need to take it completely out. Really try not to remove parts from the bike. Uh, some bikes that are maybe a little more pricey will use a hex key or Allen wrench like this. And then there will be um, another type that you don't need to use a tool at all because they use what's called a quick release. So there'll be a lever here and you just flip the lever open and that will unclamp this clamp and allow you to adjust the seat. So you can see where you need it. Make sure that you have 
the seed aiming in the same exact direction as the frame. It should be parallel with the frame. If the seat's off to the angle, off to the side, that can be kind of painful to ride on, distracting. Um, so make sure you get it straight. The saddle should be level like this one is. And on less expensive bikes, you would loosen these bolts. Don't take them off because this is a complicated little contraction, contraption. Just loosen them, level the saddle, and then tighten them. And I believe this bolt is a 14 millimeter. Now, some bikes use a different design for the seat post. They don't have these bolts on the side. They have one bolt underneath that is an Allen bolt. And so you just loosen it some, level the seat, and then retighten it. If you are teaching a kid and that kid's bike has training wheels, you will need to remove the training wheels. Now, before I get into that, uh, remember I said your kid has to be able to reach the ground with their feet flat on the ground. And if the bike is too big for that, like my daughter, when I bought her a bike, uh, her first bike, um, it was a little too big. She needed to grow into it for a year. So if the bike is too big, the kid's not ready, leave the training wheels on. That way they can ride the bike and have fun with it, okay? Uh, keep in mind, training wheels, all they do is keep the bike upright under mostly ideal conditions. They do not teach you how to balance the bike, but uh, they do teach a, a learner, a newbie, how to pedal the bike, which is important later on. Now, if you are taking the training wheels off, uh, generally this is gonna be a 15 millimeter mechanics wrench, maybe 17, but generally 15 or you can use one of these adjustables. And this little dial here, right here, adjusts the width of the jaws on this wrench. So you're gonna put your wrench on the flat sides of this axle nut. And that's what holds the whole training wheel assembly on for each side. And this is one area where you have to take that axle nut completely off. Take it off. Pull the pull assembly off, put that axle nut back on, and then tighten it. And then do the other side. Please don't get these axle nuts loose, both of them loose at the same time. And the reason is, is that you want to keep the wheel centered in the frame. You don't want your chain getting loose or groovy. So one side at a time, take it off, put the nut back on, Tighten that nut, then do the other side. So we also take off the pedals, and this is the hardest part. The other stuff we've shown you is actually pretty easy. The pedals can be kind of tricky. Um, the reason why we, we remove the pedals is they are kind of in the way physically. When somebody's trying to learn how to balance, the pedals are hitting them in the shins or the calves, and that can be painful. Um, and they're a distraction. They're in the way mentally. Somebody who's trying to learn is trying to use the pedals before they even know how to control the bike. So for this job, uh, you might be able to get away with removing the pedals on inexpensive bikes and kids' bikes using a 15 millimeter mechanics wrench or one of these adjustable wrenches as long as it has a relatively short handle like an eight inch. If the pedal has kind of a skinny narrow space for the spindle you're going to need a pedal wrench. And again a bike shop can help you with this. So how do you get the pedals off? Um, with a kid's bike Kids' bikes have what are called a coaster brake. So when you pedal backwards, the pedaling stops, and that activates the brake in the back wheel. So it's easier to get the, the pedals off with those kid bikes and coaster brake bikes. Most adult bikes, though, when you pedal backwards, 
the whole crank keeps spinning around because you have a free wheel assembly on the back wheel for the, for the gears. And when the whole thing can spin around on you, it's more challenging to get those pedals on. So we're gonna talk about the right side first. And the right side is always the side with the chain. And what we do is we point the crank on more or less towards the front of the bike or the front wheel. It can be forward up like this. It can be forward down like this, but forward. We put our wrench on the flats of the spindle and we'll show you what the pedal looks like in a close up. So the, the wrench is now pointing towards the back of the bike, towards the back wheel. And what I do with both tires on the ground, the bike's not upside down, is I put my upper body weight, one hand on the pedal and one hand on the wrench, and I push down on both of them. That prevents the crank from spinning backwards on me, while at the same time, the wrench breaks the pedal loose because the pedals can be pretty tight. So that's the right side. The left side is kind of the same motion. Crank arm forward, put the wrench on the flats of the spindle, put your weight using both hands, your upper body weight on both the pedal and the wrench, except you're gonna notice that we're turning a different direction here. The right side is as I described earlier, you go counterclockwise to loosen. But the left side is reverse threaded. It's the only part of the bike that goes opposite of that normal rule. So normally we would go this way to tighten something, but on the left crank, you have to go this way to loosen. And there's a reason why they made that besides confusing people. Um, it's because when the pedal is on, and you're riding the bike, if it's threaded this way, it's gonna un unscrew itself, which you don't want to have happen. So it's reverse thread. An easy way to remember this is the top of the spindle, this part in here, rotates towards the back of the bike on both sides to remove the pedals. So here's what a pedal looks like, sort of, depending on your pedal. So you have the big part that you can see, and that's where you're gonna put your hand, one, one hand, and some pressure downwards to hold that, the crank in position. This part here is called the spindle, and it runs completely through the center of the pedal. And this part, the threads are hidden when the pedal is attached to the crank or the bike. The only part you're gonna see of the spindle is this part, and that's where you put the wrench. And you'll see there's a flat side here, and there's one on the bottom too, and then some curved side. Other spindles will use six sides that are flat, so you can get your wrench on at any angle. And then, of course, if you feel like you're all thumbs mechanically, you can have somebody who's mechanically inclined to help you. You can um, get a bike shop to help you. I will say bike shops are can be pretty busy places right now. Um, a lot of people are trying to get repairs because the bike industry doesn't have any bikes to sell right now. Um, there are not many. So everybody's going to the shops trying to get old bikes repaired so they can ride. Let's briefly talk about wearing a bike helmet. So first off, uh, we strongly recommend for first timers to wear a bike helmet. Uh, if you were first time skydiving, first time playing football, you would wear a helmet in those activities just to prevent an injury. Um, same thing with riding a bike. It's within the reef realm of possibility to fall off that bike or to crash into something and hit your head. And we don't want anybody getting a serious brain injury over 
something as awesome as learning how to ride a bike. You should also know your local laws. So New York City requires bike helmets for kids 13 and under. If you are in Rockland County, New York, everybody has to wear a bike helmet when they are riding a bike. So please check your state, county, or city laws if you are not uh, living in New York City. And uh, so the way to wear a bike helmet is make sure you know which side is the front. Oftentimes it'll have a little logo here, but not always. And the back side, we're gonna have a good picture of the back. We'll often have a fit mechanism that is kind of at the base of your skull, on your neck or upper neck. Um, and oftentimes that fit, fit me mechanism will have a dial on it which helps uh, an inside strap, plastic strap, grip your head a little bit. Uh, so that, that way they can make fewer sizes of helmets and you know maybe one helmet or two or three helmets fit a large number of head sizes. The helmet has to be covering the forehead and it should not be resting on the crown of your head here. It should be resting pulling on your head like a hat, not a crown. And uh, as you can see, she this is my daughter, by the way, when she was about 10 years old. Um, you should have enough space to fit two fingers between your eyebrows and the bottom of the helmet. Now, if the helmet is tilting back when you try to buckle it, you have these side straps that come down on each side. And you can adjust those straps using a side buckle on each side. Uh, if the helmet is tilting back, exposing the forehead, you want to adjust the straps to let some slack out here so it's not so tight, and tighten the strap that comes towards the front on each side. Um, and then you want to make sure that this side buckle ends up below the earlobes right here. And the side strap should form a V around the ear on both sides. Now, if you have, uh, you know, the straps gotten unbalanced, you can usually pull the back through the, the rear of the helmet to get the straps even on each side. And then you have a chin buckle where the straps from each side meet kind of underneath the chin or jaw. And when you have that buckled, you should be able to fit two fingers in there. Um, you shouldn't have a big loop of material hanging down when it's buckled. But at the same time, it shouldn't be like binding or choking you. When you're done, the helmet should feel comfortable. It should be snug, secure. It's like you're wearing a hat that's buckled on. And what this picture is illustrating is that when she's looking up, she can just see the bottom edge of the helmet. If you can't see it, that means you probably have too much forehead exposed. Okay, so this is the part of our presentation, and that is uh, learning how to balance first. Before I get into that, I think I forgot to mention asking questions and discussion at the beginning of the presentation. So I'm gonna do that right now. Um, normally, uh, my coworker is here helping us and she intercepts questions and, and makes sure that I stop the presentation. She's not here this evening. So you can try raising your hand and if I notice that and I'm able to unmute you, I can, uh, you can ask a question verbally. You can put a question in chat and we will cover those questions at the end. And then also at the end, I will uh, give people the option to unmute themselves. Right now, everybody's muted, uh, just so that uh, we don't have background noise, people doing dishes or whatever. Um, and uh, we'll let you unmute yourself to ask questions verbally at the end if you don't want to put it in chat. 
Okay, so let's talk about our teaching method for teaching somebody or learning how to ride a bike. So I've taught a lot of our uh, kids' classes, um, and what I want to say is that there's kind of some rules that you need to have here. One, riding a bike is fun. Once you learn how to ride, you've gotten over that difficulty. It's a lot of fun. So try as much as possible to keep the learning process fun. Uh, that means if you are teaching a kid or somebody else, don't criticize them. This is kind of hard. Uh, be a coach. Be a coach who tells them what to do, how to do it, but don't criticize. It also means being patient. This isn't about performance. It's about learning something new, which can be hard. Be positive, especially for adults. Um, you know, it's kind of embarrassing and hard, and some people are like out of shape, and, and this is hard work. So be positive. You've gotten this far. You're trying it. You're trying something new. That's a great thing. Uh, be positive with your kid especially when they do something right. Be positive with them with just for trying. Uh, be positive with yourself just for trying. Take some breaks. It's the summertime. It can be hot. Today was a beautiful day to learn, but uh, it can be hot and, and humid. So take breaks uh, because this can be hard work. Bring snacks. Make sure you have water available or a water fountain nearby. And then our classes are two hours long. And our success rate at our classes is about 75%. But not everybody knows uh, how to ride a bike. But they do learn a method for how to keep practicing. So keep a time limit. Two hours max. Give it a rest. And then try again some other time. If you were teaching a child, what I would suggest is taking the pedals off and doing all that stuff we showed you before. Uh, and just let the kid use the bike that way anytime. You can go on YouTube and see a million what are called scoot bike or glider bike or strider bike videos for kids just riding them around. And what they're learning as they use those is how to balance and control a two-wheeled vehicle like it doesn't have to be a special event. Oh, we're going to go learn how to ride a bike today. No, just I'm going out for a walk. I'm walking the dog. I need to go to the grocery store. Let's bring your bike with the pedals and training wheels on. And you can just roll along with me. And I did that with my daughter when she was learning at about the age seven. Okay. So if you are teaching somebody else, one of the things I'm going to say is, you know, we've emphasized these talking points and teaching points, but you also have to teach visually, which means you get on a bike or get on their bike and show them, practice what you want them to do, what these teaching points are showing. And unfortunately, we don't have great video. Uh, we're working on making a teaching video for Learn to Ride. Um, but, you know, what you're saying, the words coming out of your mouth may not translate well, but visually, if you get on a bike and show somebody as you're talking about these points, it becomes much easier to understand. All right, so the teaching points are, you sit on the seat and you stay seated. You're not standing up or straddling the bike. Very important. Eyes forward. We constantly have to mention this and remind our students. Look ahead, fix your gaze on some object ahead of you. A person, a park bench, a tree, a lamp post, a sign, whatever. And keep it that way. Don't look down in front of your front wheel, which is where everybody seems to want to look. You look down, you lose your balance. Uh, and then, so you're going to move the bike using your feet on the ground. And what we strongly suggest is, you know, if my hands are my feet here, 
putting both feet forward towards the front wheel and then pushing back at the same time with both feet to propel the bike forward. And keep doing that, propel the bike forward, keep pushing, keep using your feet, and you wanna pick up some speed. If the bike is barely moving and you're standing up, you're not sitting on the seat, it just wants to fall over and you're not gonna learn how to balance. So you have to pick up some speed. Now speed, momentum, is one of kind of those risks that you have to take, especially if you're an adult. And as with anything in life, whether it is dating or uh, being an entrepreneur, you have to take a risk to get the reward. No speed, no balance. You have to pick up some momentum. The bike will just fall over if it's barely moving. When it is moving and has some momentum, the wheels get a gyroscopic effect, which actually helps balance the bike. You may not realize that as a first time student, but it does help. Then the second little risk that you have to take is when you get the bike moving with some speed is lift your feet off the ground. Don't just constantly depend on your feet to keep yourself from tipping over. Uh, if you don't lift your feet off the ground while the bike is rolling, you're not going to learn how to balance and control a two-wheeler. Now, you can put a foot or both feet down to prevent falls and tip overs. And that's the beauty of this method is that you're using your feet to propel the bike. You're lifting your feet to roll or try to roll, but you can always put a foot down or two feet down to prevent yourself from falling. You don't need somebody else holding you up to do this. And we'll talk a little bit more about how to use your feet to help you with your center of gravity while you're keeping your momentum. Uh, we will send you some videos. Again, these are not instructional videos, uh, but for now we're trying to use some pictures. So this, this little girl is practicing and you can see she's got some momentum because her streamers are kind of flying backwards. And, um, She's pushing herself along. It looks like her pedals are off. It's a little hard to tell. And it looks like she's kind of rolling her and controlling the bike in a straight line. What I would like to see her doing, though, is not looking down in front of the pedals. Um, I have a couple more videos here. I'm going to take a pause here for a second to deal with a small admin problem. Okay, the user who just put the mark on the screen, I thought that I had that shut off. Uh, can you please uh, figure out how to remove that mark? Okay, moving along. These are videos that we are not going to show tonight. Okay, some other teaching points in this process. Um, if the bike has handbrakes, please use start only with the right brake, which controls the brake on the rear wheel. 
Uh, the front brake is actually more powerful even though the brakes are identical. It's just physics. Uh, so if you are on a slope or you're picking up some speed and you have handbrakes, use only the right one. Another thing we've learned is uh, if you start to lean to one side, you can steer slightly, don't overdo it, but steer slightly in the direction of the lean. And your bike will actually recenter itself, it will right itself. Conversely, if you start to lean to one side and you steer in the opposite direction, you're instantly going to go out of balance. Um, so let's just imagine you're rolling along, you feel yourself tilting left. What you want to do is steer left. Uh, steer that front wheel left and slightly, and you will recenter yourself. Uh, as to the third point, I already mentioned momentum, but the way to do this uh, alongside the steering is you're rolling along, you feel yourself start to lean to one side. Um, what you can do, because you, you don't want to just keep stopping every time you. you think you're going to lose your balance because that can be hard work. Getting the bike going again and getting some momentum gets to be hard work. So you want to try and keep your momentum. And what we tell people is, hey, if you feel like you're leaning to one side, put your foot down to that side. Don't stop the bike. Just put it down and push yourself back up to center. So you sort of kick yourself back up to center while the bike is moving. And that may push you to lean in the other direction. You put that foot down while the bike is still moving. So try and keep it moving um, and use your feet to kick yourself back up to kind of a, a centered position. Because really what you're trying to do here is figure out your center of gravity, uh, which you figured out when you walk, but now we're on two wheels. So how long do we practice this walking, gliding, moving the bike along with our feet, trying to practice balancing, trying to figure out our center of gravity? There's no time. Some people figure this out pretty quickly, like five minutes. Other people, it may take two hours, four hours, six hours, uh, not all in one session. It's what we're looking for. So what we're looking for is, can the cyclist roll the bike along in a straight line with their feet off the ground? They've lifted their feet off the ground, they're just rolling along. They're not swerving around, they're not wobbling, they're not leaning and constantly uh, you know, having to put a foot down or stop the bike to prevent themselves from tipping over. If you can roll the bike along in a reasonably straight line, with your feet off the ground, you're probably ready for pedals. Now keep in mind as the bike slows down, it's gonna like tip over. So we don't worry about that part because that's just pivot. But if somebody's wobbling around, uh, swerving constantly, having to stop, having to put their feet down to prevent a tip over, they need to practice more so they can get their balance. We want one thing at a time. Balancing first, then pedaling. So again, this is a picture that kind of shows what it might look like or what it looks like from one of our classes in Brooklyn at McCarran Park. And you can see this, this uh, lady here, she's got pedals off and she's pushing herself along and she might be doing that technique that I suggested is when you are rolling along, you start to lean to one side. You can see here she's leaning to her right as she puts a foot down. By the way, it looks like, I don't know, maybe maybe these are shoes. I wouldn't recommend wearing sandals. Maybe it's just the color of the shoes she's wearing. Same for this person here. Looks like he's moving along, but he started to lean off to the right and Put a foot down and kick yourself back up to center so you're not leaning. And this is our nice instructor. Um, I mentioned 
having both feet forward and pushing back. We recommend that, but you can also use a walking motion, which is what um, these two students might be doing is walking the bike, but you do still have to pick up momentum and uh, move the bike along, get it, get it rolling faster. So let's talk about how to introduce pedaling once somebody is balancing and controlling the bike under their own control. So obviously we have to reinstall the pedals. Um, you remember that pedal anatomy slide I had with the spindle? When you start the pedal threads into the crank, you have to use your fingers. Don't put a wrench on it. The wrench is for final tightening or loosening. It's not for starting the pedal. These are actually kind of fine thread pedals, um, or the pedals themselves are fine thread. Keep in mind the chain side is right, and to thread the spindle in, you go clockwise. If you're on the left side, you have to go counterclockwise to thread the pedal into the crank. Another way to remember this is on both sides, that spindle, the top of it, as it rotates, is going towards the front wheel. So how do you tell the left and the right pedal? Because the pedals kind of look identical to each other. You took them off, you put them off to the side, maybe not paying attention to uh, how you took them off. But one thing you can do is when you do take them off, orient them them in a direction where you remember and know which one was left and which one was right. But if you don't do that, there's a couple of ways to tell. Most pedals are going to have a stand somewhere here on the spindle, usually the end of the spindle, this flat end. It will be R or L. You might be able to find an R or an L somewhere on the bodies of the pedal or a sticker that says that. Now, if your bike is old, maybe the spindles have gotten a little rusty or the stamp was never in good condition, there's another way, possible way to tell. And that is the spindle to the right side is going to have a smooth side where, where you don't put the wrench, so it's not flat. And the spindle for the left side is going to have a series of fine grooves on it. Uh, the other way to tell is just go back to the, you know, what I suggested is if you put a pedal in and you're turning right on the right side, you're turning clockwise. If you, it never wants to go in, you probably are trying to screw the left side pedal in the right side. Now, what I'm going to say is this is a safety issue. And it's also kind of like a mechanical integrity of your bike issue. It is possible to accidentally thread, I think it's hard to do, but it's possible, the wrong pedal in the wrong side. And people have done that and they've used their wrench to tighten it through, but what they're doing is they're stripping the threads out of the crank. So now nothing's really holding that pedal in. It looks like it's in, tighten it up, but really you damaged the part of the crank that's actually holding that pedal in. And that can be very dangerous for the person riding the bike. If they go to put their weight on the pedal, like they stand up and pedal, or they go to start, all of a sudden the pedal comes out and their full weight and force is off. And that can be a bad crack. So make sure you are getting the correct pedal into the correct side for that pedal. Okay, I said something you know, that we don't hold up the bike or hold up the student. And in one of our videos, we show our instructor here, Irisema, who's very good. Um, she's doing exactly that. So what she's doing here is the bike is not moving. She has the student sit on the seat and the student is looking at her face. And the student's holding on to the handlebar, but our instructor is also kind of holding on to the handlebar. She tries to find a place to grab it. And she says, without looking down, 
find the pedals because you're gonna have to do that while the bike is moving. So she gives the student a few times to practice without looking down, lift your feet off the ground and find those pedals with your feet, not your eyes. Now, if you're teaching yourself, you could maybe lean against a fence or a wall or a tree, something solid with one arm or a shoulder and without looking down, lift your feet and find the pedals and just practice that. Because when the bike is rolling, you're only going to have so much time, so much momentum to find those pedals with your feet without looking down. So the next step in terms of teaching is that we get on a bike or the student's bike and we show them what to do next while we're explaining it. And what to do next is pretty much what you were doing before, but with a difference at the end. So what you were doing before was you look ahead, you use your feet on the ground to push the bike along and get some momentum. You glide with your feet off the ground, but now while the bike is rolling, once you've lifted your feet off the ground, you need to use your feet to find those pedals. And by the way, at this point, we keep the pedals at even, level, three o'clock, nine o'clock, not six o'clock, 12 o'clock. Once those feet are on the pedals, some people just kind of roll along, glide along with their feet resting on the pedals, but most people try to start pedaling, which is what we really want them to do. Without the pedaling, the bike is just going to roll to a stop. I want to mention something about spaces and, and slopes. Uh, most, some of the spaces we use are just table flat. Other spaces we have have a, a slight slope to them. And a slope can be helpful, at least on the down, downhill slope, side of the slope, because it helps you get some momentum and it's easier. But then you have to go back uphill and that can be hard. So with a slope, at the bottom of the slope, we, you know, people can get off and walk their bike to the top of the slope. I would not recommend anything really steep. Like if you know Washington Heights in northern Manhattan, yeah, Fort George Hill is not the uh, place to teach a first timer. Right? It's a long, steep hill. Van Cortlandt Park in the Bronx has a bike path with a long, steep hill. No, don't do that. People are going to pick up too much speed and get hurt. But a slight little slope, that's fine. Okay, so there are probably going to be some issues that you have to watch for and be aware of as somebody tries to start paddling. One is you have the seat all the way down or pretty far down so they can rest their feet on that. And that's great for learning how to balance, but not so great for trying to pedal. And what happens is as they try to pedal through the top of the pedal stroke, they're lifting their thigh and their knee so high that they can't get through the top of the pedal stroke. And so they shift their weight a little bit, their hips on the, the seat, and they lose their balance. So we kind of watch for them. Are they having a hard time getting through the top of the pedal stroke? And if they are, we raise the seat one or two inches. And uh, that might be worrisome for the new student, but there will still be plenty of foot contact on the ground. They won't be super tippy toe, but it will make the pedaling easier. The other issue that we see is uh, with kids' bike that has a coaster brake or the type of brake where you pedal backwards and it activates a brake in the back wheel. Kid will be cruising along, they're doing just great. Um, they lift their feet off the ground, and the first pedal, or the first foot, goes on the back pedal, puts some weight on it, and activates the brake, and they stop. And that's kind of frustrating, because now they did all that work to get some momentum, and they just screech to a halt. So if you see that happen, again, you want to keep the pedals level, 3 o'clock, 6 o'clock. And... Um, 
remind the student that their first foot on a pedal has to go on the pedal that's pointed towards the front, the, the front back. Uh, a couple of other things I want to mention here. Uh, some people have already know how to pedal stuff. Maybe they had a tricycle as a kid, or they've had a bike with training wheels and they're pedaling, or they had one of those plastic big wheel things, or a toy car you could ride in and you could pedal it. So they are now they know how to pedal something. But we run into other students who have never pedaled a thing in their life. And I think those students have a harder time because they get the bike going with their feet on the ground. They put their feet on the pedals and they're rotating the pedals, but really the bike slows down and stops. What happens? Well, those of us who are riding a bike already, we make it look easy. Like that student is looking at us and they're saying, man, they're just cruising along and it looks so effortless. But no, our legs are actually putting in a fair amount of effort. So if you see somebody who's sort of acting like the bike should be able to pedal itself, you need to remind them that no, your legs are the engines here. You have to put some leg muscle into the pedal. The other thing about pedaling with a multi-geared bike, like 21, 24, 27 speed mountain bike or hybrid, is you want it put in a gear that's reasonably easy to pedal, but not too easy. Um, so you'll see the chain, and you might have to have somebody help you with this, but you want the chain on one of the middle gears or maybe a little bit to the left on the set of gears on the back wheel. If you have three gears on the crank set, on the pedals, you want the chain on the middle gear. If you only have two gears on that crank set, make sure the chain is on the smaller cog, the smaller gear, or the one that's to the left. So what we want is a gear, a, a chain combination that's easy to pedal, but not too easy. Because if it's too easy, people spin and spin and spin, but they're not really giving the bike any momentum. That gear is for going up a hill. If they're in too hard of a gear, they have to put a huge amount of muscle in it to turn the cranks and they lose their balance trying to muscle it through that. So something that provides the bike with enough push that requires a little bit of muscle power. So be patient here. Um, this takes some, some patience, combining the balancing that they just mastered with the pedaling. Um, just you know, keep coaching yourself or your student uh, through that. Remember, eyes forward, get momentum, get momentum first, then try to pedal. This is another thing we see is people will have the bike in a stationary stop position. The bike is not moving. They will lift their feet off the ground and try to pedal. Even experienced cyclists. I mean, I can do it, but it's really hard. No, you have to make the bike move first, then pedal. Okay, so a lot of people will start pedaling pretty, pretty quickly at this stage, and it's pretty exciting. Uh, it's a lot of fun. We chat and clap and cheer. You know, it's, it's really fun to see somebody pedaling for the first time. Uh, and some people have so much fun, they start zooming around, zipping around. They're weaving in and out of the other students who are still practicing. They're making some sharp and tight turns. And that's where you really need to intervene and show people how to stop a bike safely. And we do have a video that will be shared with you um, tomorrow in a follow-up email on how to stop. But this is another area where if you're teaching somebody else, we get on the bike and show them how to stop 
while explaining. So uh, we have kind of three, three to four rules we explain here. One is use all the brakes your bike has. If you just have a coaster brake pedaling backwards, use that. Some bikes have one or two hand brakes with a coaster brake. Use all three of them. Some bikes have one hand brake and a coaster brake. Use it. Use both. Uh, most adult bikes are going to have two hand brakes, and this is where we introduce using both brakes. Now, the brake levers on the handlebar, uh, we want people to know that those are not on and off switches. You can squeeze them gradually at first and then squeeze them tighter and tighter. Some people just like slam on the brakes and it feels like their bike's out of control. No, you squeeze gradually tighter, gradually, gradually. And then as you squeeze tighter, the bike will stop more quickly. But please don't just slam on the brakes every time you need to stop. Second, keep your weight on the seat. If you're using a coaster brake and you lift your weight off the seat, you're actually making your back wheel less effective as a brake. If you're using hand brakes and you lift your weight off the seat, you have to remember some physics here. Those hand brakes are stopping the bike, but your mass, your weight, is stopping more slowly than the bike is. So you're being thrust forward, your, your mass is being thrust forward. And if you unweight the seat, a couple of things happen. One for sure is you're making your rear brake less effective. And another thing that is more dangerous is that now that back wheel is much lighter and your front brake has 60% of your stopping power and the back wheel comes off the ground and you flip over the handlebars. So please don't do that because that usually results in an injury. Serious injury, like a broken collarbone or facial injuries. Uh, so keep your butt, your weight on that seat while you're using the brakes, please. Third rule is keep your feet on the pedals until the bike stops. So one habit that people pick up during learning to ride is, oh, I'm gonna fall over, I'm gonna put my feet on the ground to keep my balance, and it also stops the bike. Well, that's great while you're walking it along with your feet, but once you start pedaling, you can move the bike along a lot faster. And your tennis shoes are not really good brakes. You have to use the brakes that the bike uses. I've seen kids doing this in my neighborhood where they are cruising along, they need to stop, and all of a sudden their feet go down like the landing gear on an airplane or Fred Flintstone. None of us are named Fred Flintstone, and that's not how you stop a bike. So you keep the pedals, and your feet on the pedals, you use the brakes until the bike almost stops, and then you lean off to one side and put your foot on the side that you put your foot on the ground on the side that you're leaning. Um, and usually this also involves just sliding off the seat just as the bike is stopped. And then a final uh, pointer we give to first timers is, uh, has to do with turns. So we're dealing with a vehicle that has two wheels in a line with each other. And unlike a tricycle, when you turn, those two wheels get out of alignment and they want to lean a little bit. Uh, and that's natural and it has to happen. So sure, if you have a huge amount of space, you can make a turn without leaning. But most of the time, on a bike path, on the street, on most curves, you have to lean in the same direction as your turn. So if I'm turning left, I have to lean left. And then a little safety reminder, if you're turning sharp, and generally with any turn, it's a good habit, to develop. The inside pedal of your turn has to go up. If it's down and you're turning, especially a sharp turn where you're leaning a lot, 
the pedal can strike the ground, causing the back wheel to jump or skip off the ground and you lose control. So if I'm turning and I've been pedaling long and I stop pedaling and I'm turning left, let's say I'm turning left, my left pedal has to go up. Uh, and I just make that a habit because if I do need lean sharper, turn sharper, my left pedal, if I'm turning left, won't strike the ground. Um, that, would, that does cause crashes for that to happen. And then finally, congratulate yourself. You've gotten the basics down. We're not ready for a lot of things, not even the bike path. We haven't taught anybody how to use gears. Uh, we're not going to do that tonight. Uh, but congratulate yourself for coming through really the hardest part, which is learning how to balance and control this thing. Um, so that is the end of our uh, slide deck, our presentation. And I am going to open it up to questions. And you can unmute yourself. I can't unmute you, but you can unmute yourself at this point to ask questions. Or you can put questions in chat. I'm gonna look at chat and see what we've got so far. Uh can I ask a question? Sorry, hi, Fumi here from the Bronx. Um, so a question about, because at the very beginning you did go through um, how to take off the pedals to learn how to glide. Do you need to take off the pedals to learn how to balance and glide? Well, that's a good question. Um, I'm going to say maybe not. <laughs> That, that is the hardest, the trickiest mechanical task in terms of setting up the bike. Right. It can be a real pain. Some people who assemble those bikes use massive strength and force to tighten the pedals. Well, you don't really need to. You just need to get them snug. If you are going to leave the pedals on, keep in mind they stick out. And you're, the method we showed you, you're going to have to keep your feet spread out further from the center of the bike with those pedals on. Another question related to that is, can I use a city bike to do this, to learn how to ride? You might be able to, but you are not getting the pedals off those city bikes. They're not coming off. Uh, it's a special system they use to prevent people from stealing parts. Uh, so don't even try taking the pedals off of the off of New York City's city bike bikes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Looks like we had a question in chat. And so uh, somebody asked, when do you think you will start in-person classes again? Is there a way to take precautions since the classes are outdoors? So first answer to first question is, we've been offering free classes all over the city for the last several years, many years, 15 years, except for this year, uh, for obvious reasons. And we do not know, due to the coronavirus pandemic, uh, which is still a huge problem in the United States, uh, New York has done better, New York City is doing better, but we are not, we don't live in isolation here. So we're trying to be very cautious that our bikes and equipment and our classes are not, don't become a vehicle for the spread of the pandemic. So pre-group classes, the way we, we've been doing them for the last many years are not happening for the foreseeable future, and we do not know when they will start up. So you have a couple of options though. One is a private lesson. If you want a private lesson, you can contact me and we will do our best. We are kind of short staffed also due to the pandemic. I'm putting my email address, but you've all gotten it, got my email address. Um, and I will, I periodically like once a week send out an email about our private lessons policy. 
our private lessons are not free. The fibro bike tour was canceled and we have to bring in income and we just can't have staff doing pri uh, free private lessons. Uh, we are going to start, I haven't had bandwidth uh, time wise to get this going, but we want to start doing very small group classes, like four to five people. And those will also not be free, but they will be much less expensive than private lessons. Uh, so contact me if you are interested in either of those options. Now, if you're teaching a child, we do have some very limited opportunities. Um, we are offering free classes for children between the age of five and 16 at Shirley Chisholm State Park, um, which is in South Brooklyn. Uh, and those classes are very small, partly because the space itself is very small and we don't have a lot of bikes available. So it's like four kids, five kids at a time. Um, I think the first class tomorrow is at, um, at 11.30 is, is full, but the second class at 2 p.m. is available. Uh, we've had problems with our registration system, so if you want to get into that second class, email me ASAP like this evening if you want to teach a child in that second 2 p.m. class. And those classes are going to be on Thursdays. Uh, we have working with New York City Department of Transportation for a class for next Thursday, a week from tomorrow. And that class will be in Harlem. And again, this, the numbers are going to be very limited. And that will be bring your own bike and bring your own helmet, which is how our kids' classes normally work. The second part of your, your question is, is there a way to take precautions? So, you know, with our, what limited group classes we are doing, we give people hand sanitizer, we require masks, our instructors and staff have to wear masks. And then uh, at the end of the class, we give people hand sanitizer again, and we, um, we wipe down with a sanitary wipe the contact points of the bike, which are the grips, the brake levers, the saddle, uh, any part of the bike that a student is likely to touch, the top tube of the frame, uh, the handlebar, things like that. But we're just not doing, like we were doing classes, 20, 25 people at a time for free. We're not doing that right now. And it's, it's probably not for the rest of the year this year are we gonna be able to do those? Hmm, why can't I post this? Whoops, that's why. I'm trying to put my uh, email address in the chat. And I'm having problems doing that. So you have my e email address from the Zoom confirmation I sent out twice today. And that's how you can get in touch with me regarding private lessons. Okay, folks, it's 7.30. Does anybody else, I'm happy to answer more questions. There is a lot of silence on the other end of this uh, Zoom meeting in terms of questions and comments at the end. Um, so I'm gonna wrap up and you will get a follow-up email from our communications person calling tomorrow with a lot of resources in it, including a recording of this meeting with the slide deck. And she will also send you the uh, 
the videos that I, I did not play during the slide deck. Um, so I want to thank uh, everybody for joining our meeting tonight, our, our class. And I want to wish you all luck. It's not easy. Uh, it's even less easy during the pandemic. Uh, if you have any questions or want some support, you know, feel free to email me. And, um, you know, good luck to everybody. We have had some folks contact us after these classes and say, hey, I, you know, I, I taught myself how to ride a bike. And so we do want to hear, uh, hear from you, uh, just hear how it's going. Uh, so good luck and everybody, good night and stay safe.